everybody and welcome to first indiana robotics's history of game design webcast um this is session four or five where we go through a bunch of games and talk about them and talk about what was cool um my name is nick and joining me today as always is the wonderful liz smith liz tell us about yourself hi i'm liz um i'm on the first indiana board of directors and i work for antimark awesome and uh I'm Nick Lawrence, an alumni from uh, actually Ontario, Canada, way up north there, a bit far away from home. 
also work at Animark as a mechanical systems designer, and I'm uh, the lead mechanical design mentor for uh, 3940's Cyber 2. Um, and joining us today, we have two wonderful first alumni. This is an all first alumni show happening here, which is very exciting. We have Lucy Baker and Kate Sample joining us, uh, longtime firsters. Uh, Lucy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, my name is Lucy. I was actually a student of Nick and Liz's on Team 3940. Um, I'm from Kokomo, Indiana, and I now go to Purdue University, where I am a part of the Purdue FIRST programs, still involved with, with FIRST here, so that's super awesome. Other stuff about me, I've been involved um, with FIRST kind of basically my whole life. Um, I grew up in it. Um, I really got involved starting in 2009, I think when I was like nine years old, and I started volunteering that year. And ever since then, I've really been hooked. Yeah, so the games that we're gonna go over today, I was a volunteer in that time period because I wasn't yet a student on a team. Um, yeah, so I did a lot of field reset, did some odd odd jobs here and there on the field. I even in high school, when I was part of the robotics team, I was um, the president of 3940 Cybertooth and was a student um, on the board of directors for First Indiana, so yeah. Awesome. Thank you for taking time out of your busy, you know, life schedule. And Kate, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so thanks for having me, guys. Um, like Nick said, my name's Kate. Um, so I got started in first um, just after I turned five years old back in 2003. So Stack Attack, for those of you who uh, know that far back, or at least watched the episode where we covered that game. FRC Team uh, 1108 is the team that I graduated off of. It's in a teeny tiny town called Paola, Kansas. Um, not many people know it, but uh, we did come to Indiana and have quite a showing in 2014. So if you haven't watched the match footage, I recommend it. Um, <laughs> We'll talk about that a little bit later as we get into that game. I participated as a volunteer and a coach um, for First Lego League and First Tech Challenge. Um, I currently coach a first robotics competition team um, in South Florida as I relocated there about four years ago. Um, their team 3653, the Botcats. So I'm the head mentor for that team. Um, and that's always a roller coaster of fun with those students. Um, I have held a lot of volunteer positions within the FRC program. So I've done everything except be a judge because the age limit was 24 up until about yesterday. So hopefully this year I'll get to fulfill that role as a judge. Um, but some of my favorite roles include being a control system advisor and being an MC and game announcer out on the field. So I get an up close look at the robots and how the action works. That's, that's awesome. Those are like totally different parts of the volunteer <laughs> spectrum. Um, that's pretty talented to be able to both like troubleshoot robots and also be an MC. So like, well done. Uh, that's really, really hard. Um, so I'm really excited for our group of games today. These uh, are the games where like I was learning how to be a mentor, um, but also like I'm a crazy person and obsessed with the strategy. So these games really are like a strategist like dream. Definitely excited to talk about them, and let's jump in. 2013 was uh, Ultimate Ascent. Um, Lucy, what was this game about? There's like frisbees and like big jungle gym things. Like, what's up with 2013? Okay, so yeah, Ultimate Ascent uh, 2013. There was one game piece that was used, which was the frisbee, um, and there was a lot of gameplay kind of stretching all the way across the field with a lot of um, shooting because you could really score from anywhere on the field, which was kind of a unique thing. And there was a lot of like, even from the feeder station, that was a huge deal um, of teams who learned how to do a whole full field shot. And that was kind of the big challenge of that game was being able to consistently shoot um, throughout the whole match. Yeah, and there was also with the end game um, climbing, there was different stages of the pyramid that you could climb up, get points on. But I think in the end, there was a lot of um, low, bar scoring and not as much of the high high scoring on the tower. Um, but yeah, there was three different places for you to score um, with a lot of different point values. And yeah, it was it was a pretty hectic game with a lot going on. Um, and it was a little dangerous in the fact that like um, first had to use nets so that uh, Frisbees wouldn't escape the field. There was a little bit of danger with the robots climbing up the ends with some falling potential there. I know that was a problem. I wasn't on the team yet, but with um, 3940, we have an infamous clip of our robot um, falling. It's it's pretty it's pretty amazing. Um, but yeah, this was 
kind of like Nick was saying, really strategic game, with, especially with like where to shoot, um, different auto stuff. So yeah, I'm sure we'll get into all that good stuff. Yeah, th this game's super interesting um, in the sense of one of the things we covered a lot in the previous session so far is the different levers first has has pulled to um, sort of kind of control or map what gameplay is going to look like. And this game has like two totally opposite ends of the spectrum of you could shoot from anywhere, but um, at the same time, there were like a lot of rules about how you could climb. Kate, like climbing was really governed, right? What was that all about? So uh, from my perspective, it was really high risk, high reward, right? So you have this, this tower, um, a red one, a blue one, one for either alliance. It, it total height, 120 inches. So first tier was at that 30 inches, which really isn't that scary of a climb if you think about it. 90 inch mark, um, which would be that tier three scoring. Um, and as, as Lucy mentioned, there are some of those robots that went for that high goal uh, or that high tier of climb. Uh, but there was high risk. If you fell from any great height, there's no promises that your robot came back in one piece, at least. <laughs> Although, Nick, you did bring up a good point, right? How first really kind of pulled that in a direction of this is something you can do. So some teams even chose from a strategic point of view, it's worth more to spend the match climbing and getting up there to, to score the, the colored frisbees in the top of the tower. Um, rather than shoot at all. And so there were some robots that didn't even have drive bases. There was no wheels located on the robot. It simply started on the ground and then reached up and kind of pulled itself up. And there was, there was some other very restrictive rules about the angle at which your robot could lean without breaking um, the extension outside of your frame perimeter, basically, there was there was like a cylinder of, oh no, you're tilting, don't lean outside of this. Um, and so that made for some really interesting climbs, kind of like we saw this last year in Infinite Recharge, um, where if your robot was hanging and you were swinging, then you would fall out of that um, and receive a penalty. And so that was kind of an interesting element with the, the climbing the pyramid in 2013. Yeah, definitely. The um, I mean, obviously the pyramids were like the, the dominating feature mm -hmm. on the field, right? Um, and they they weren't necessarily just for climbing. A lot of teams actually found them to be a nice landmark, Lucy, for a place to shoot from, which probably wasn't an intent of the GDC when they designed this game, right? So yeah, so there was a lot of different ways to kind of, um, for drivers to know where they were on the field. And one of those things was kind of having a, a contact thing that they had on the robot to know that they were touching uh, the pyramid. One of those, like it could be as simple as a zip tie sticking up that they drove under it or passed it and brushed on that and knew right where they were. So that was a really creative thing, um, especially since the field was so open um, with that, with the exception of these pyramids. So uh, yeah, it was a really good reference point, I think. And speaking more about the end game, I do think it's pretty interesting that um, kind of since this game, we haven't seen a lot of multiple different point values that you can get in end game. So as Kate was kind of talking about, you can teams had that whole dunk kind of situation at the end, if they made it all the way to the top or um, the different point values that you had for each row. So that was kind of interesting, whereas all the games that you know I played um, as I was a first student, um, it was all like you climb the rope, you climb the bar or something, and you get your point values. But I like how there's a lot of variety with this one and a lot of different change to make the end game a bit more exciting. Yeah, and it was really um, interesting with with the pyramid. Uh, a lot of the previous hanging games that we saw were, were you know, grab the bar and lift up, right? And, and get that one unit of points. <laughs> um, and this one really, it was, it was a new and really kind of difficult challenge overall. So was it worth doing all that and climbing all the way to the top and taking all that time? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question, Liz. So it almost depended on um, definitely your strategy at the beginning of the build season, but also about the quality of, uh, of intake and shooting that your robot was able to achieve. And so like, like Lucy had mentioned, teams could make full court shots. Um, and so the interesting thing about the Frisbee is if you ever throw a Frisbee, to throw it consistently is not the easiest thing, right? They wobble quite a bit um, if, if air gets around them. And in first previously, we really hadn't had a game piece like the Frisbee. So we mostly had things that were round or things that you just pick and place. Um, and so launching a Frisbee was a really new concept to teams. And so 
um, some teams were like, we can't build a consistent shooter. We'd rather, you know, take that high risk, high reward climb because we know we're guaranteed the points if we can make it up that high. Whereas other teams were like, we're going to figure out this shot and we're going to shoot as many Frisbees as we possibly can into those um, higher, you know, point value goals. Um, so, you know, I did see a lot of teams that were making full court shots that were absolutely way more competitive um, than the teams who just went for the climb. And I think a lot of that was because if you miss a few shots, you just readjust and you keep shooting or, you know, um, but if you fall from level two, there's no guarantee that you're just going to be able to start back climbing all over again. I think the what you're alluding to the variety of robots um, and strategies that were like valid in this game is probably why this is in my top like three favorite games of all time. I mean, like Lucy, you had some regionals that were one with like one or two 30 point climbers that did the majority of the point scoring. Whereas on Einstein in the finals, there were no 30 point climbers in the final matches. That's kind of crazy, right? Yeah, that is crazy. It, it, it's open for a lot of variety. And I think that's really exciting as like a viewer to be able to know, you know, you're never, you don't know exactly what is going to be seen in the match and you don't know the outcome. So I think it, that really keeps it exciting, especially for spectators and for when you kind of look at your schedule and you're like, well, we're against this team, but anything could happen with your different combos. It's really hard. I think looking at the different challenges I'm like climbing is hard like Kate was talking about shooting is hard too just on its own the scoring sections in on the field are small and they're up high and even if like if you look kind of at some um, footage like autos were never really perfect like you're always going to miss them just because those goals were not super forgiving so it is I think it was really interesting to see it kind of did shake down to consistently shooting was really valuable and what was kind of what Nick was talking about what was seen a lot in finals and the top the top tier of competition but it gave an opportunity for a lot of different robots to be able to contribute a lot definitely and, and speaking of robots while this show is supposed to focus primarily on game design the big lever that got pulled that year was the robots got way smaller um, we went down to 112 inch frame perimeter um, whereas previously you could build a robot that had like a 28 by 38 inch starting size, which was massive compared to a robot in 2013, compounded with the fact that there's this little low 30 inch bar. Um, Kate, the packaging problem got turned up to 11, right? Absolutely. So fortunately, the Frisbee itself was not a massive game piece. You could hold four um, game pieces within your robot. Um, but luckily, right, Frisbees, they're skinny, they stack. So you would see a lot of teams that would intake them and they'd kind of go into that stacked formation. Um, so that was kind of nice. And a lot of teams, you're right, um, Nick, they wanted to have that small profile so that they could, um, you know, if they were not going to make full, full court shots, but we're going to kind of move to their side of the field and then begin shooting. Um, they'd like that right where they could just fly under the pyramid um, with no issues. So teams, teams like that, in addition, right, you wanted to be small if you were going to be a climbing robot because you had to fit completely within um, kind of the two bars to be like, safe inside um, the zone and count for that scoring. So that was kind of interesting because you did see a lot of robots who they didn't quite make it. And so some scores didn't count because just barely the bumper, you know, wasn't above the line or a wheel didn't make it, um, stuff like that. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in the beginning, back to some of the game design aspects. This Frisbee was a, was a hard plastic Frisbee. And I think there were a lot of safety concerns about it. Um, yeah, I think Lucy mentioned there were nets around the field to kind of protect all of the people around it. Also, one of the unique things about this game is they made a really big change pretty much after week zero, which week zero um, historically is, is what we call kind of first test event that they run. And, and typically it's an event in New Hampshire where they set up a full field and they have teams who... Um, maybe aren't completely ready to play, but um, have enough of a robot to start playing, um, and they test out the game. And um, there was kind of one big change that occurred after um, week zero. Uh, Kate, do you want to talk a little bit about that that change? Yeah, so it was, it was really kind of an interesting takeaway that I don't think the game design committee was in, intentionally ready for, or I don't think anyone was. Um, but when teams came out to kind of play at that week zero event, um, 
originally the rule had been written that in the last 30 seconds, any um, of the Frisbees or the discs that hadn't been scored and were kind of back there behind the wall um, could be thrown to be, um, you know, enter the field and, and attempted to score. And so what ended up happening, kind of a combination between it's a week zero and not everybody's robot is perfectly competition ready, um, but also kind of some strategy and maybe some some thought processes by drive teams was there's so many frisbees back here. Let's as fast as we can, you know, launch these things onto the field. Um, and that didn't end so well. So <laughs> there, there kind of had to be some some rule changes put out. Um, and the game design committee kind of had to think, well, it's not how we thought that would go, right? They had intended for more robots to kind of be at a higher competitive level to score those discs. And so they had to kind of rethink and say, all right, let's iterate the game a little bit. Let's make an improvement so that there's um, an opportunity for, you know, better gameplay and also less hazard to volunteer staff or people in the stands um, so that flying Frisbees don't go every which way. And this was, this was pretty controversial when this happened. A lot of teams built their robots around expecting, you know, what we affectionately call the blizzard, right? I mean, most of the discs were white and it looked like there was kind of snow mm -hmm. flying everywhere. Um, and they were expecting to take advantage of the, la the last 30 seconds um, where there would be a lot of discs available so they wouldn't have to drive so far and they could, you know, cycle as many of the discs as they could in the last 30 seconds and then go for a quick 10 point hang. This was pretty controversial. A lot of teams were kind of upset that they built the robot around what they thought was a major aspect of gameplay. They kind of felt like the rug was pulled out from under them. Realistically, those teams still had a pretty big advantage. They still had the ability to pick up discs for autonomous period for five, seven multi-disc autonomouses, which, you know, were were pretty impactful for the match score because there were bonuses for scoring an auto. Um, so they weren't like really at an actual disadvantage. They just kind of felt like they were when they, they saw this news. There's a, there's a pretty big takeaway here about iteration, right, Lucy? Yeah, so a really big takeaway from this, I think that teams can learn is it is a good idea to kind of walk through how you think the game is going to be played ahead of time. Even, even practicing things that you don't think really need to be practiced. I mean, I think Another issue at this week zero was that obviously the robots weren't super ready for play, but also maybe the they didn't expect that the feel the human players would be um, so chaotic. So maybe that's something to practice ahead of time. But also just think of what can happen ahead of time and try to walk through that and really be ready for competition play by staging everything so that you can be ready for changes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, FIRST has gotten really, really good as of late about making sure they do their walkthroughs really early. We get to hear from some of them in some like YouTube videos and Twitch broadcasts about how they've improved their process because of this game um, of doing more walkthroughs uh, with, with real humans. Um, and we, we got to see like a new elevation of that, which we're going to talk about in, in episode five, but we got to see this kind of happen again, where we saw a few weeks of infinite recharge and we get a new season where we hopefully get to play, you know, another version of infinite recharge. I'm excited to talk about that, but um, you know, for the games between there, like they, they've got a lot better about going through things. I, I could sit and talk about 2013 for like literally four hours, um, everything from autonomous strategies about the center discs to um, whether you run two cyclers and one defender on a full court shooter, like, there are a billion ways to play this game that, um, unfortunately, we got to move on because we got to cover three other games. Um, and our, our next one, Kate, um, is one that I know is really near and dear to your heart is the 2014 game. Absolutely. So a um, little bit of a backstory here. The reason it's so near and dear to me is it was my junior year of high school and uh, that little nine student team from Podunk, Midwestern, Kansas, um, made the the not seven to nine hour commute all the way to Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, we were fortunate enough to compete in this game, probably one of my favorites um, for many elements that we'll get into. Um, loved, loved the folks in Indiana, loved getting to compete and kind of see the game play out in action. Um, and, and the game as a whole, right, was just stellar. One of the things I really want to want to bring to light is field change. So in the in the previous games, right, if you look at the field, you kind of have those slanted driver stations. Um, and so that was really what we were kind of all used to. Um, and when this game came out, the first thing I noticed is it's an actual rectangle and it almost looks like there's nothing on the field. I mean, this was like the most empty field we'd seen probably since 2008, um, just because of its sheer, like, it's just carpet. Like we can go anywhere and do anything. 
So in addition to, um, you know, that rectangle shape of the field, we also had, um, for the first time that we'd seen in a while at least, those human players back to the sides of the fields instead of behind the driver stations, um, which actually played a unique um, element of, of the gameplay. Um, so uh, we had these three zones of the field, of red, white, and blue, and only one game piece out on the field. Um, and a little bit more unique, not just a single game piece, but one that was shared between the three teams on the Alliance. So we had this a um, little bit larger yoga ball, not quite as big as 2008, um, but that game piece would be passed between the three robots, between those three zones, and then it would be scored in either a high or a low goal. And then they also had the opportunity to launch it over a truss midfield and then also to catch that ball for points. Yeah, definitely. Like only a few actual like actions, but a bajillion ways to play uh, aerial assist, mm -hmm. um, which like, I'm pretty sure like, I don't know, 80% of regionals were one with a slightly different strategy from the other regionals, <laughs> uh, different combos of robots, whatever. Yeah, this is one of my favorite games, um, but we talked about this in a few other games. This game was really designed to pass the ball between each other. So there's one game piece for your Alliance, I think first in this year chose to um, make that happen by a lot of rules. So there were a lot of rules in place that kind of made this a little bit complex. Yeah, so with, with aerial assist, the way I looked at this was first was really pushing teamwork and communication more than they had in some of the previous games. Um, because you're right, Liz, with that one game piece that's moving between robots, um, the incentive there was was with the scoring. With the assist, right? It would go from one robot to the next into that zone. And that was like a multiplier on your score. And so it was, it was worth more, the more robots um, hands, so to speak, it passed through before it was scored. And so I really think that was kind of one of the more unique things. And to me, the reason I really liked this game was I felt like there was a role for everybody. Sometimes when you're, when you're on a, you know, three team alliance, you have a really strong offensive robot, you have an, you have, you know, an okay offensive robot, and then you might have someone who, um, you know, can do some things, but might be more beneficial for defense. But an aerial assist, I loved that, you know, the idea of possession and really participating in the assist was so easy for so many robots, regardless of your design that it really, right. Everybody was able to play as long as you were taking the, the time and the, you know, energy to communicate with your alliance partners to make those cycles happen as quickly as possible. Yeah, I really like that about the, that game. It kind of forced almost uh, like, a, like a sports field of this game. But, but Lucy, with a single game piece, um, there's some challenges with logistics about this game. And you were a like superstar field reset person. You want to talk about some of your experiences and some of the challenges you had to face um, in that role? Yeah, definitely. I think it is, it's super interesting um, going from 2013, where there's obviously tons of game pieces that are going everywhere all the time to then go to this one, where it's one per alliance. So it was definitely a hassle as a field reset person, like throwing balls during the match, which is something that I don't think was very common at all to um, kind of have the field reset a part of the match because we have to, we have to get those balls from one side to the other. But I think it was a really cool component that just, it, it made the field like feel like such a cool like living kind of piece to have both like field reset people a part of the game but also to have um i think a lot of teams really utilized those human players and had them part of it even like handing their robot handing the balls to robots kind of making sure that was legal with rules i think that was maybe the intention but to kind of um have some assist there was really cool so it, it was it was a struggle and it was hard because i think the biggest thing was you didn't really get a break as a field reset person. Like after the match, you're making sure everything was ready to go. And during the match, you were hauling these balls from one side to the other. But it was really cool. And I think it was really cool to incorporate so many people into the game. You know, I've never thought super critically about like the field being like a living thing, right? But that's like a super analog to watching, you know, football or whatever where there's lots of moving pieces on the sideline that you like if you're at a game you can see them you know the people with the, the down markers whatever and you know line judges and, and all of that um that those kind of things you they show up because you're watching the staff as part of the game um which is like totally unique to this game for an audience perspective where everything that's happening in the arena is important there's not anybody standing around who's near the field who's not being utilized for the game to succeed 
um, which I don't know, it's super cool. One of the things about that makes a, a single piece or single game piece game difficult is you can't automate everything, right? Like you can't put, you know, ball possession sensors into every single robot that's out there, um, you know, back in 2014. And um, it's not necessarily easy to, you know, have like an array of sensors to detect that a game piece has scored um, through all of those goals. So there was, there was a, a, like a human element that really drove what the pace of the match was, right, Kate? Absolutely. So um, the interesting thing with with this is humans are not perfect, right? And and that's okay, right? We don't expect everybody to be perfect. But a lot of the difficulty was when when the game piece enters the field, um, some teams were, were at such a competitive level or had such great teamwork and communication that they could cycle that ball almost too quickly for a human to, you know, put into the ref panel like, okay, this robot and this robot and this robot. They, they, the team had already scored it, right? And now that the they had passed the ball and scored it, they're waiting for their next game piece to enter the field because in 2014, you could only have, right, that one game piece on the field at a time. And um, so there's this pedestal back behind the driver's stations. And not until the ref has, you know, identified on the panel how many robots possessed it and counted it as scored would that light up signifying that that game piece could then go back into play um and so that that made kind of things a challenge because you know like i had said when teams get at that extremely competitive level which is what we would see as the weeks went on and teams either competed more or really you know understood that we have to come into this with a strategy ready to go communication keywords um you know as they improved you know, refs couldn't keep up um, because like you said, Nick, right, we can't put those sensors in every robot to make things automated. Um, and so that kind of hindered a little bit of gameplay, um, not in a negative way necessarily, but just maybe something that the game design committee and also teams didn't anticipate. Yeah, it was definitely a kind of like one of the, the limits that was never like rigidly defined. You, you'd have kind of a, a slushy limit there. But but Lucy, probably the biggest, like the, the hardest part of that limit was the fact that the referees had to do like two completely unique jobs, right? Yeah, so that was definitely, I think, something first learned from and has improved upon since then. But it is, I mean, this game was such a defense heavy game. I mean, open field, there was a lot of robot interactions, a lot of fouls going on that robot, that, Referees had to keep track of, and I mean, it's hard when there's, I think sometimes a lot of robots just blend together out there. Um, I mean, there was a lot of movement going on just with so much space. So they had to keep track of that in addition to keeping track of the scoring, um, which like I said, so that's something that first has recognized, and now there's like a scorer usually who works with the referee. So kind of like two people doing um, two jobs, whereas in this game, it was one person doing two jobs. And I'd like to think that, like, the one of the things we're going to talk about a lot is the, you know, the rapid iteration that shows up throughout these games, um, both on the team side, but also first side for, you know, iterating things. Um, like, we saw the the advent of, like, the dead ball card, where um, if you had a disabled robot that was in possession of a game piece, you could actually declare that game piece dead and, um, you know, start a new cycle. That, that was a thing that came after a team update um, that... A lot of things were learned in this in this very um, you know, I don't know different game in the sense of you know being more on a on a robots as a sport end of the thing. Um, but honestly, like what people probably remember the most, um, Kate, is that the the championship matches were incredible for this game. Absolutely, I think um, edge of the seat doesn't even begin to define like how intense everything was. And one of the things I really want to call attention to is is the the use of the human player in some of those matches. Um, and even at the lower level, you know, not the championship gameplay, um, but the regional gameplay, we would see some incredible like human player interaction. And maybe not something that the game design committee had considered when putting those human players on the side of the field. Um, you know, maybe they. Uh, we're just there to kind of keep the game pieces in the field, you know, and return things as quickly as possible. Um, but it was so unique in the fact that, you know, they became part of the game. And so teams would cycle and they would understand that sometimes it's better to, you know, pass it to the person who's ready. And that person might not be a robot. It might be a human player. Um, and some of that gameplay was just down to, to seconds. Cycle time was faster than you know I think anybody really had anticipated um and even just the auto scoring became out of this world intense I mean 
I know when I first saw the game, I thought, okay, one ball, maybe two ball auto, you know, if you're a really competitive team. But then to see those those robots get to a three ball autonomous was just like the most mind boggling and intense, like, oh my gosh, they did it. Like they did it and it scored all in 10 seconds. Yeah, it's really fun to watch those robots in their their own zip code. Um, like th this year has my favorite robot of all time, the 2014 Cheesy Foods robot. Um, because of that free ball auto and their ability to produce something that didn't just score the game pieces in 10 seconds, but could score them in five seconds, all three of them, um, by reading which goal was the, the bonus goal for autonomous or the hot goal that year um, and decide, okay, I'm going to drive to the one that's not hot and go shoot the three. Like mind blowing um, to, to see stuff like that. Um, but yeah, like I, I really think first succeeded in this game of, um, if their goal was make robots exciting and like this is the sport for the mind, they really achieved that in this game. Um, even though this game was like mostly cooperation themed and like you know teamwork, whatever. Um, I guess teamwork is you know team thing, but like they really achieved the holy crap, robots looks cool when you're just walking in off the street and you see this crazy gameplay going on. So we spent a lot of time talking about um, the the 2014 games like tally up period, right? Because that's like the star of the show is the robot to robot interaction. But Kate, we had a a pretty unique autonomous mode for this game, right? Yeah, so one of the biggest difference to, um, you know, the games we talked about earlier in the episode was the autonomous for, um, for aerial assist was actually 10 seconds instead of the traditional 15. The high goal was kind of broken up into two parts. And so during autonomous, for the first five seconds, one of those halves would be hot or lit up with a ring of lights. Um, and then the other five seconds, the other half would be lit up. And so um, not only do you get a bonus for scoring in autonomous, but you also get a bonus if you're able to score in the hot goal while it's lit up. And so there was a lot of um, really creative like strategy and a lot of vision um, and a lot of like work to kind of figure out how can we best lead off in autonomous so that we're really going to be the most competitive robot out there and making sure that they were getting all three of the starting um game pieces off the field so they could start those cycle times yeah and lucy those those three game pieces were like make or break right uh, they were super impactful for the rest of them yeah it was it was pretty crazy so cycle times kind of like what kate was talking about were huge and um autonomous really kind of defined the pace of the game just because of that in the cycles that happened in auto um so if you didn't make all of your auto shots, you weren't able to reset, reset your cycle and have another game piece introduced. So if you were to miss or um, something were to happen with one of the robots and you still had one of those out, um, that could be really detrimental to having a new game piece put in and getting some more cycles in. While that was really exciting to have all these variations and amazingly uh, just really astonishing autos, it was kind of something that maybe would sway people to not try the auto because you could you could score really big, but there was also a lot of things that could go wrong and really negatively impact your game. Yeah, definitely a, a really big impact. Um, and you know, some teams negotiating of who is going to score them, who is not. But one one thing that I want to talk about briefly is in a lot of games we have um, a changing value of a goal for autonomous versus teleop, right? Um, where maybe there's a point bonus per game piece going through a goal for the entirety of auto. But the unique thing is. For, for this game is the changing value of a goal in a given time period, right, Kate, with the hot goals? Absolutely. And that, that was something that was, you know, really cool about this because the, the hot goal was determined um, through the FMS and was completely random. So it wasn't like, all right, we're going to be on the left because in this match, the left side is going to be hot for the first five seconds and then the right side will be hot. Um, so you really kind of had no way of knowing, but um, like I had mentioned earlier, that kind of provided a lot of really interesting um, vision opportunities. And so one cool thing that came out of it um, was cheesy vision. And so, you know, the drive team was able to communicate with their robot, whether the goal was hot or not, so that they could, um, you know, ensure that they were, they were scoring and not that, not that the cheesy poofs, you know, had utilized that as much because they had an incredible three ball auto that shot, you know, <laughs> within five seconds. Um, but it was a great resource that I know a lot of teams um, had utilized. Yeah, that that resource, I mean, we could probably spend a, a whole show talking about Cheesy Vision, but it, there's some irony about this, right? So um, the, the Cheesy Poofs in 2012, our previous show, um, that was a game that had a, a true hybrid period where you could use um, the Connect station that was part of the field and signal to your robot and, and do stuff. 
Um, and the cheesy poofs, the robot was in, entirely autonomous and could score game pieces by itself. Um, so they had some fun with the Kinect Station in that game. And then they go out and do something similar to their advantage to both, like, because they use it just to say, this goal's hot, this goal's hot, and the robot did everything. Um, but also some irony, which talks about, you know, goalie pulls a little bit as well. One of the best other robots in the world that they face on Einstein used cheesy vision for um, the goalie aspect of that game. Right, Kate? Yeah, so the goalie zone was located, um, you know, in a, in a small, really strip of the field, and it was right there between the two low goals in front of that high goal. And so first actually put a lot of rules around those goalie bots and where they were allowed to move and how they could extend. Um, and it was, it was really like an interesting take on defense. Um, there was still defense allowed outside on the entire game field, but really kind of just the ability to really impact somebody's shot by moving back and forth is something we see a lot in sports, right? In traditional sports, you have somebody who stands in front of you and does this, so you miss your shot. And that's kind of the way that the, the goalie robots, you know, uh, had worked. And so, um, you know, and I know you can talk more about this, Nick, it's your, it's your passion, but kind of in that finals three match, really make or break. Um, that match could have gone either way by just this much based on the way that 11-14 um, had utilized that cheesy vision to be that defensive robot. Had they have impacted, you know, 254 scoring in auto, I mean, that match could have gone their way. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason that went to three, right? And it succeeded in one of the matches and just robot geometry said that it wasn't going to be possible. Yeah, I, I could definitely talk for like an hour about finals match three and like every second something new happens. The interesting thing about the goalie concept in general is there's been a balance um, in first games that we discovered all the way back to 2003 is the celebration of like the GDC having to pull levers and keep a balance of the celebration of cool autonomous routines with um, the balance of strategic plays that a team can do to counter in those games. Like we talked a lot about this in, in 2003 and how that was like kind of super impactful for the game. We, we see a bunch of newer games where like even just crossing the center line now in autonomous is like a big no-no because the you know routines are, are complex. But um, this game, like there's a bit of a cookie, right? Of no, you can't touch the robots as you talked about Kate, um, but you can directly impact the outcome of auto with just a little bit of movement. And I, I think that's super cool. And we haven't, we haven't seen something like that where there's a deliberate cookie of, yeah, you can do real defense and auto for, for quite a long time since this game. <laughs> okay, so Aerial Assist was like all about interactions between, you know, the field staff, human players, the game pieces and the robots, lots of robot interaction in that game. And then we come to 2015 and the pendulum swings the other way. Lucy, what, what was Recycle Rush all about? Yeah, so Recycle Rush, kind of like Vic was talking about, has a lot of contrasts to um, what we saw in Aerial Assist. Two of the biggest ones being um, the, the the field is separated, so there was no interaction between one alliance to the other alliance. And the other big thing being it was a really, really cluttered field um, in contrast to the really open field that we saw in 2015. So um, one thing about there being no... Um, interaction between one alliance, one alliance and the other means there were no bumpers this year, which was um, a really big thing. But there was a little bit of cooperation in the middle where there was like a little space um, for both some stacking of yellow totes for cooperation because this was the first year that first had incorporated ranking points, which we have seen um, ever since then. And also, there, yeah, and there was a little bit, um, especially as the game got played a lot more, there was some contention with those middle cans as um, there was wars to see who would get those when you were capping with um, different variations of scoring and what you could score and stack and enough time for the gameplay. Those middle canisters are sometimes what decided the match. So yeah, there was also the other big game component was the litter, which had a lot of involvement with the human player putting those in. And so yeah, this, this game was definitely a, a engineering feat for a lot of teams. I think we saw a lot of really complicated, really, really cool robots this year um, that did some pretty amazing things and held so many large game pieces, but... Yeah, Kate, um, you know, this is actually a good segue. Um, probably the, the most unique thing, the lever that the, the Game Design Committee pulled was they they got rid of a bunch of robot rules, right? They, they basically said, um, you have to transport your robot to the field in one size, but once you're at the field, like, have at it with size, right? So first almost opened too many doors and windows for a lot of teams. Um, so when you look at a game, you look at 
you know, strategy, right? What game pieces are there? How can we manipulate them? How can we best score them to be, you know, a really competitive robot? Um, and, and how do we make all that fit within the rules that we're given? And in 2015, first was kind of like, let's see how creative people can get. So they, like Lucy said, right, they did provide us with three drastically different game pieces, which meant for three drastically different ways to intake and, um, you know, score those things. In addition to that, you're right, Nick, like the the transportation um, configuration versus the on-field configuration. So we had a lot of robots who um, still stayed in one piece and started as they did and ended as they did. But then you had some of the more, um, you know, creative and, and ingenuitive teams who kind of decided, like, it's going to start out in this funky shape. And then when we get out here, it's going to break into two separate pieces that are still, you know, connected because that was part of the rules. It, it made things interesting. The field was already a little bit um, full, not only with game pieces, but with the scoring platforms. And so then to say your robot can now be multiple pieces in multiple locations kind of made things more interesting. In order to succeed at this game, um, you you basically had to throw away half your notebook about how to build an FRC robot. That's a that's a thing to really consider when you're working on your games is like the game design committee made a conscious choice um, to like flip the scripts on what a typical FRC robot was, right? Um, and they they did it via having a game where you could divide the field, right? And you could basically build what you want without having to worry about you know, legitimate defense, right? Um, so they, they open these doors, probably, you're right, maybe too many of them. Um, but at the same time, like, it, it offered a lot of really unique um, and really cool things to come out, you know, the big, like, ramp bots and, you know, all of them 14, just, like, flipping the robot into three pieces or into two pieces and then, like, expanding for the field or, you know, probably the biggest one, 148, with their stacker in the corner and the, you know, other robot, like Batman and Robin. Um, like, that was crazy, right? Like, like I was on a team that built a traditional looking robot that was a drive base with an elevator and a, and a thing. Um, and like, we, we didn't really think of splitting our robot into yeah. several pieces, right? Like we're talking a lot about game design on the show, right? But like, that's like probably the biggest change when it comes to like, how do you build your robot? That was a function of game design. Yeah. So um, this year there was kind of a, um, a set limit for, for the, like the total score you would get. Uh, Lucy, could you talk a little bit more about how um, the scoring kind of worked? Okay, yeah. So there were a ton of different ways to score just with having three different, really, really different game pieces and being able to have basically an endless combination of how um, those go together with your stacks of totes and then putting your cans on top, litter, without litter, and then, of course, the um, cooperation totes that you would put in the middle. And there was a bit, not only of scoring in this game, but there was a lot of like unscoring as well, just because um, the field was pretty cluttered and you could knock stuff over pretty, pretty easily, which it really did make the game a lot about execution because you were on your side of the field. And if something got unscored, that was on you and your alliance with um, just having the robots separated. And it was, it, like I said, very untraditional in the way that scores worked with ranking points since this is a new system that was incorporated in this year and maybe you won the match but you ended up going down in rank or going up in rank winning the match was only part of it which was something really new and there this is kind of reshaped the way that first is played and the way that um, ranking happens but I think it was a little hard to follow in addition with the scores kind of throwing that in um, especially spectators it was just having so many different point values and even game pieces themselves could be worth a different amount of points depending on the scenario so there was definitely a lot to juggle in terms of scoring yeah kate um one of the the things that you know these teams have to consider when they're working on their games is the balance of experiences right um the balance of team experience which in this game was pretty good for the i'm building a really complex robot like engineering part really good um, but the audience experience um, was different in this game, right? Absolutely. So uh, like Lucy had mentioned, with a variety of different point values being assigned to different things, um, you know, if, if grandma and grandpa come to a regional and they're sitting in the stands and they're watching a wall of totes being built, that doesn't necessarily mean that team and that alliance is winning because on the other half of the field, right, they might be only putting up three stacks, but they're capping them with those cans and that litter. And therefore, their value is infinitely more. 
than just six totes sitting on a platform. That kind of made some things interesting for, for spectators because you weren't always sure what was happening. Um, in addition to that, that some of the, the viewing on the field could become difficult because as a wall of tote was being built, um, your vision of what was happening then on the, like, you know, the farther side of the field um, was removed. And so it, it wasn't necessarily, um, you know, a bad element of the game. It was, it was actually really, you know, what I think unique because um, the, the driver's station being like so close to your, your gameplay, right? So in typical years, right, the driver's station is on this end and you're scoring on the other end. So you're trying to navigate and see things on that end of the field. With that split field, you were looking directly in front of you. And so it wasn't like the opposing alliance could build a wall to prevent your vision. It was you and your alliance had to work to make sure you weren't eliminating your own field of vision so you could keep scoring. Yeah, definitely vision being, you know, a, a major factor. And like you would you would sit and plan. Like if you were, you know, um, fortunate to be on an alliance that had a lot of tote scoring power that could move a lot of game pieces, you had to think critically about the order of which of where you placed your stacks, how close you could pack them without you know, tipping other ones over. But um, you you had to really think critically beyond like just I'm going to put totes on the platform. That's what I'm going to do every match. Like strategy came back at those higher levels of play when you're starting to move a lot of game pieces. Games like this um, are 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 difficult to balance the the audience experience of I I want to see teams do well, right, Lucy? But also there's the dark corner of the room of you're you're almost looking or as a like a fan type person, you're you're hoping someone doesn't succeed, right? Yeah. So uh, as someone in the audience, um, especially when there's a maybe an alliance with a lot of powerhouse teams that are going up. Um, first of all, there's a, there's a big awe factor um, when totes fall over, and that's a big mess, and that's kind of impressive and something to switch up the game, maybe put the other alliance ahead. But also because this game was so individual and based on your average of score, you were kind of looking to see if maybe some of those higher ranked teams were going to not have as high of an average or not score as much in one match and maybe dip that average a little bit to help boost you up. So it was a bit less of um, cooperation in this game and just collaboration because it was so individual based. Yeah, definitely a kind of the maybe the, the darkest part about that that game in particular. But like realistically, like overall it was good, right? Like we, we had good experiences for the teams. There was a lot of tech development, Kate, with respect to a lot of people put a lot of time in their in their intake systems that show up in a bunch of later years. Like teams learn to throw force power at their intakes, right? Absolutely. So without the concern of defense, right, um, and and concerns about like uh, making sure that you can you know cycle as quickly, right? Teams could could stop and think like, how can we build the best machine possible to get this done effectively, rather than like quick and dirty, like let's score as fast as possible. So some of um, some of the robots that come to mind, right, like being able to 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 intake a tote that might be upside down or on its side or, you know, um, the correct orientation or even going from like picking up from the wide angle versus the skinny angle, like seeing some of those robot mechanisms that, that anticipated that engineering concept of like, I have to pick it up from any orientation, write it into the correct orientation and then, um, you know, score it was incredible. I think especially the, the thought process of like bringing it in, and stacking from the bottom was something that, um, you know, some of those higher level teams really came out shining in, in early um, events. And I have to admit, it's something I didn't even consider until I saw it happening. And I'm like, of course you stack from the bottom. Like, but in normal, right, humans, when you're building a stack, you don't start from the bottom. That's just ridiculous. So it was really cool to see like the automation um, and the thought process that went into a lot of those robots. One of the previous games we talked about the kind of the arms race with the mini bots in 2011. Kind of there was a design convergence to get the, the fastest mini bot possible to, to get up the tower in the fastest time. Lucy, there was something similar in, in Recycle Rush you talked about with these can grabbers. Uh, what can you tell us about that? As the level of play was really getting really competitive, especially um, at champs, there was a lot of contention with the canisters in the middle. You could cap off your stacks and get more points, not run out of those compared because there was 
not a whole bunch of canisters on the field. So having those extra ones from the middle was a really big deal. And that was a really exciting thing at the beginning of the match. Um, something that we haven't really seen a whole bunch of just to in auto have that much excitement and have so much decided kind of in the first portion of the match um, with getting those canisters. And it was really interesting because it was kind of a who could hold on the longest, who could pull the hardest when you had like basically two hooks stretching over these big craters of a whole bunch of totes, like a really, a really long stretch to get um, a little hook in this little canister hole opening um, and to see two robots duke it out was pretty exciting. We saw, um, you know, one of the most kind of unique stories that come out of the championship is we talk again about 1114 and team 900 and their, um, their harpoon situation. Right. Um, and I think previously we talked a little bit about chokehold strategies. Basically, if you could grab enough of the recycling containers and pull them to your side of the field, there would be no way for the other lines to score enough points to overcome that, that deficit. And especially if you were, um, in playoffs, if you were, um, if you do that successfully in the finals, that would kind of guarantee you the win. So um, I don't know if you guys know about the harpoon story or if anybody else wants to talk about that. The harpoon story um, involving, you know, once again, 1114 um, and 900 is um, a really interesting story that occurred at the championships with a game where each, you know, this game where each alliance started with three recycling cans each side, um, those being really valuable on the top of stacks and the four in the center that were super contended, there was a chokehold strategy that um, isn't a true chokehold, but uh, basically if you controlled seven recycling containers, there were not enough game pieces on the your opponent's side of the field for them to ever mathematically you know, beat your score, provided you actually took advantage of the game pieces you, you retrieved. Like you could just grab them but they didn't score any points unless um, you put them on stacks, right? However, there was a pathway to victory that occurred that is not quite chokehold, but um, was basically if you controlled the seven, you know, trash cans, whatever, um, and removed them from gameplay, if you were the better tote scorer, if you both had the same amount of recycling cans, if you were the better tote scoring alliance, you had a better shot of victory. And that was the point of the harpoons from 1114 and 900, where only in the finals, they wanted to pull all four of those center trash cans or center four recycling cans out of play and beat them on totes. Um, and they built this, you know, that we talked about the robot rules, you can be able to be, be any size. They built, this is like ultimate cheesecake. They built four of these borderline weapons that um, they started right against the landfill and they aimed them directly at the little hole in the center of these cans. Um, and it was one of the fastest um, mechanisms to actually get to the can. Um, it was very slow at removing them from their spot, but they had control almost instantly because it was basically, it was like literally a harpoon where it was a circle tubing driven like launcher that would fire a harpoon in the center of the can and get control of it. Um, and it was, a, it was a latching mechanism that um, once it was in, it could not be pulled out without like a special tool. Um, so they had control of them, even if they had um, the opponents like had a hook in or something, those, those, as long as the strings didn't break, they still had control of them. And the, the plan for the finals was to use these four mechanisms, um, all the same, outfit a robot, a third alliance partner, um, to use them and use them on the finals of, uh, of, of Einstein. The, the problem with all of this is there was some liberal definitions of what is a robot. Um, where basically 1114 found a team who was willing to try this crazy outlandish strategy, who was willing to rebuild the robot to be small enough and light enough that they could actually accept these four mechanisms as their own for, for being on that alliance. You know, Team 900 spent the majority of the championship building this tiny little robot at the championship and putting motors on it to you know basically be the winches to pull all of the cans to the center of the field and out of play. Because even though they had control of the cans, they had to remove them from being in the center and remove all of the mechanisms from being out of the way. So that 1114, who is probably one of the best tote, like traditional looking tote stackers in the world, could actually have access to the landfill. But the problem is 
they spent all this energy on this really cool thing and it did work like there was videos floating around the internet of it of it working they never got to the finals um the 1114 148 1923 900 alliance they didn't get all the way there um they had some issues in uh, you know on einstein in their in the semis matches and they they just couldn't put up enough points to overcome the other two alliances and actually employ the strategy um we got to all see it i mean we we got to see it, it was like behind the curtain where you could see all four uh, harpoons when you were watching einstein but um it's it's like the the what could have been um what could have been if the game was once again broken so to speak um, on Einstein for the first time in, you know, five years, right? Where we talk about the 469 robot in 2010. We talk about 71 in 2002. Um, it's rare these things happen, and we're this close to seeing it. That game was pretty cool. Um, I really like the engineering challenge. I know a lot of teams got a lot out of the, you know, the technology development. I mean, now it's almost easy to build an elevator, right? Back then, it was pretty hard. There was a lot of work involved. Now it's basically easy. There's tons of cost options and lots of information available. I'm really excited for our final game tonight the 2016 game of first stronghold this is my absolute all-time favorite game of all time of all robotics competitions kate what was stronghold all about so 2016 stronghold let's just start off with phenomenal theming to come from you know more like sports modeled games right we're using frisbees you know you're using basketballs in 2012 you're using um you know kind of like a volleyball style in 2014 and go all in on a theme uh, I, in 2015 right with recycle rush they had tried to, to to start the theming and they'd made good progress um just like you know we we hadn't seen before but 2016 i mean i think they just went above and beyond so the field itself, looking at a medieval theme, um, they've got they've got the towers, right? They've um, you know that you're trying to take control of. They've got barriers, right? That you're you're crossing back and forth um, to kind of take down the defenses to to overcome the other tower. You're scoring boulders, you know, launching these rock-looking game pieces um, into the tower to take it down. You know, you're you're conquering and climbing up above that tower in Endgame. I mean, just overall, they went above and beyond incredible with with looks, with um, you know, terminology, just the whole nine yards. Yeah, the theming of this game was like infectious, right? And that kind of makes sense, being that this is the first game where Disney Imagineering is like all in, right? This is like the first Disney game that we've seen in a very long time where the story of the game is what drives everything about an FRC game. And that switch like, is very obvious when you go from sports theme game that you talk about. There's some familiar tasks in this game, right, Lucy? We have some ball shooting, we have some climbing, um, but the, the defense mechanic, right? There's, there's all kinds of stuff. What are these defenses about? Yeah, so these defenses were super fun, especially from a field reset person. Um, changing them out was so much fun, so easy. Um, no, but defenses were really fun. Um, kind of like Kate was talking about, it, the, the theme like carried into them really well. Um, and so these defenses, basically what the teams had to do was go through them a number of times to break them down and be able to siege the castle. And with these defenses, there was... Um, a whole bunch of them that could be changed out and put in different places, um, which had a lot of strategy along with it. And um, teams had to be really robust to be able to, to get through these defenses, go under them, go over them, whatever they had to do. Um, and we saw a lot of really cool um, configurations of robots, like there were bars that teams had to get under, so height limits, there was things that teams had to lift up with the portcullis, tons of different defenses and a lot of different robot variations we saw to be able to handle them. And with this, there also was some audience participation with um, the audience being able to choose one um, defense that each team had to encounter. Um, and that was done through cheering, which was a really fun thing, especially when um, you're waiting for matches to start and you're just kind of sitting there. It's fun to like be able to pick your favorite one and do that as a crowd. And also teams were able to pick what defenses their opponents would have to go over. So this did call for a lot of strategy, um, figuring out what certain teams struggled with, what certain teams um, were able to get through what. It was kind of chaotic trying to get um, teams to submit their requests for this. Um, that was something that I did as a volunteer. I was able to like do that thing where teams submitted. And it is, I think it was really similar to how scouting works where some teams like took it very seriously 
um, spent a lot of time on figuring out how to kind of make a really strong defense and um, make it hard for whoever they were opposing to try to get through everything. It used a lot of strategy and was a really unique element to the game. Yeah, um, I definitely want to spend some time focusing on that low bar because defense one for every single match, all matches played for first stronghold was this 14 inch or so gap that you had to drive under. You couldn't drive over it, you had to drive under it. And the, the game piece was an 11 inch, you know, foam ball. That's not a lot of margin for error, Kate. I mean, th those teams had to make a lot of trade-offs, right? So not only a lot of trade-offs, but the, the way that the field is constructed, right? And so where, where um, game pieces can enter the field and move across the field, um, if you look at like a top view, right? So as, as the human player rolls in, the boulder and it's trying to go through there's this this black curtain you know of the low goal and that pretty much stops a ball right because uh <laughs> newton's laws right so you've got something in motion it's going to hit something and that's just going to slow the ball enough and so there was definitely a lot of um you know cluster in there when robots were trying to get through i saw a lot of robots get hung up whether they drive over the ball and then they get stuck under the bar and there's this whole oh no and they kind of have to back it up and move um, until they can, you know, get that situated and figured out. But so many teams had to think about how can we design a robot that is able to, um, you know, manipulate a lot of these defenses, but still fit under that bar. Um, because that was the fastest way kind of in and out um, if you're going to run cycles for, for shooting. Yeah, the, the, the trade-offs of like, oh, yeah, it's flat, right? It's just a little bit of a ramp to drive through. No big deal. Pack into my robot. That caused you an enormous amount of work um, throughout your build season, but would save you time um, during matches for the, those cycles when you're just trying to cycle game pieces was a pretty big trade-off. Whereas if you look at some of the other defenses that you might encounter, not necessarily definitely encounter, like the rough terrain was like, I don't know, very easy to drive over compared to say the rock wall, which was a, you know, a four and a half or whatever inch square bump that um, was rather disruptive. To, to, but I mean, I mean, Liz, you were you were a drive coach in this game, um, and the thing that you like to tell me about Stronghold all the time is it really felt like you were like trying to take down a castle, right? Yeah, I, I think it, it did. And as you know, standing behind the glass, you actually kind of felt like you were trying to siege a castle and take it down and and do that, which was really cool. Um, trying to to get in that mindset of of actually like playing this themed game and, and being there in person. Um, and I think there, there was really a lot for um, the teams to do. There was a lot of action on the field all the time. Uh, you know, this is kind of one of the, the first games in a while that we've seen where you got points just by doing a driving task, right? And you got points for driving over some of those defenses. Yeah, and the, the, the contribution to the ranking point as well. Um, mm -hmm. If you could, you know, as an alliance drive over, but I think it was four of them twice, including the low bar. Um, so a total of eight crossings was worth a ranking point or half of a match win, um, which was like a big deal that like when we saw this game, we were like, okay, that'll be a given at some point, but it wasn't a given early, right? There was, you know, drama around of, Are they going to get this ranking point? Are they not? Are they going to just try to focus on the, the game pieces? But you know, speaking of ranking points, uh, you could earn a ranking point simply by just driving, right? You know, doing a driving task to get over some of these defenses, maybe with one external mechanism to manipulate maybe a portcullis or a drawbridge or something. But there was also a ranking point available related to the tower and the game pieces, right, Lucy? Yeah, so shooting or um, just placing your boulders in the two different scoring zones was the other really big component of this game. Um, and if you got eight boulders within um, the tower, whether it was low goal or high goal, um, which were their own respective amount of points during auto and teleop. Um, but if you got eight in regular season and then they did bump it up to 10 for at the championships for a ranking point to get, um, you had to score 10 compared to eight. But um, yeah, that was a whole ranking point. And like Nick talked about earlier, like that's a whole half win. And it is really cool that they had multiple places to do this. I mean, the high goal was, was a really tough thing to get boulders effectively into. Not only could teams pretty pretty easily be able to drive and go over defenses and get contribute to their teams that way, but also be able to score in that low goal and contribute to multiple different ranking points, which was really cool. And the other big thing with the boulders was the human player aspect within it, which was um, pretty intense this year with having the human players maybe be pretty athletic, maybe be have some bowling history um, to get those boulders in and get them 
as far as you can into the into the field and over that little section where a lot of the boulders would get caught. Yeah, definitely bringing back the need an athlete again mm -hmm. for human players. That shows up. We we talked a lot about that, especially in two thousand nine and two thousand four. We talked about that a lot as well. And in, in prior games, uh, it's it's fun to see that keep popping up as well. One of the the pillars of that puts this game on a pedestal for me um, is that equal contribution of um, the boulders being you know in the low goal or the high goal, um, where everybody can equally contribute to that that specific ranking point and like that's pretty unique, right? Like, like it, it really lowered the barrier of entry of trying something, trying to do something um, with a game piece. And like, you could always contribute. Like you saw, like we saw a bunch of um, regional and district events won in week one and two with alliances that could never put a, a boulder in the top of the tower. Like they they played the logo game, built up their ranking because they, get, they kept getting that ranking point every time. Um, and then pick robots that were really good at cycling game pieces, and they just they cross all the defenses. They got all the bullets in the tower, and like they they could outlast the teams that were spending time trying to line up for the high goal because it was pretty hard at that point. I I definitely think something that I think we talked a little bit about for other games, but this this game was super friendly for iterations and um, changing throughout the season. I mean, you could start out as a robot who did a little bit of driving and really worked on those defenses, and then maybe you slowly get up to trying to manipulate that boulder and do the low goal and contribute to that ranking point. And then maybe you even iterated more now that you had that mechanism and were able to do the high goal. The, the other big thing that like, I think makes a very good first game is a game that scales well at all levels of play. And this game was exciting week one, all the way through the championship, right? Absolutely. I don't think there was a time I ever watched this game where I wasn't mesmerized. So it, it starts with the week one events. Um, I don't know if you you all are familiar with the 179 Children of the Swamp, but watching that robot come out at a week one was like inspiring to see that so much could be done in two minutes. Like I was just like, okay, so it is possible. Like you can cross all the defenses, right? There is going to be scoring high and low. There's going to be um, you know, movement all around the field by all Alliance members. Cause something that, that, you know, the game design committee may or not, may or may not consider, um, but something I recommend teams consider when designing a game is making sure there's something for everyone. Right. And so regardless of robot capabilities, um, just making sure that there's something everybody can, can accomplish. And Nick, you kind of touched on that, right. Where like low goal scoring was a thing and a really big thing and still very, um, you know, important and impactful in those rankings. And if, if you weren't, you know, delivering balls from the secret passage, right into your courtyard for scoring, then you were shooting or you were scoring, you know, in that lower high goal, or you were taking down a defense. I mean, there was always something that a robot could be contributing to. And I just found that like, so incredible. And as gameplay advanced, you're right all the way through the championship. I mean, there, I don't think there was ever a moment where you just saw a robot sit there and wait there was always something of like go 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 action and that i think is what kept this game exciting all the way through the very last second of the climb so we, we, we've talked a lot about like where the where the floor was and like what everybody can do to participate and contribute but um the the ranking point with the tower lucy was special in the sense that everybody had to contribute right yeah there was a lot of pretty easy ways to get there a lot of team contribution to get to the place where you kind of qualified for ranking points, especially with the tower um, and those goals being equal in terms of um, getting to your ranking point number. But you did have to be able to kind of storm the tower at the end um, and everybody be on the little ramps or be up in the air climbing, getting those extra points. So if, if something were to go wrong in the match, maybe somebody loses comms or something, um, or somebody's on the other side of the field that would disqualify you from getting that ranking point. So that would definitely be a priority to make sure that everybody gets back and um, all cooperate on that. Definitely. Um, Kay, I know you're a huge fan of the theming of this game, and I am too. Um, but the the theming ran so, so deep into this game, right down to how the boulders acted like real boulders, right? Absolutely. So there's so many things that that with this game, you know, we could talk about 2016 for the rest of the night, I'm sure, just like we can 2014. So like with the game pieces in itself, robots only allowed to, to hold, right, and obtain one at a time. These things were kind of a, a 
bigger and almost, I want to say heavier ball, right? Like, like, like just a different kind of foam than that 2012 basketball. Um, and so it was something that like, they kind of moved slow. They, they rolled against the carpet. They got stuck in defenses, which could really like impact um, gameplay and launching them up into the, the high goal was a real challenge simply because of the positions of the high goal tower. And then the tiny margin of error. Um, I don't, I don't have the exact specifics, but I'm pretty sure you had like maybe two, three inches of wiggle room to get that ball into the goal and coming at that straight on is one thing but coming at that at an angle is a whole nother. And so that was, um, definitely a challenge that a lot of teams faced. And another point I want to call out is, um, down there at the, uh, the, the ramp leading up, you know, the platform leading up to the, um, the tower, that low goal on either side, you couldn't just drive up and the ball would roll in. There's a ramp, right? So you can't just kind of do a drive by like, it's going to go in. You have to actually like make sure it gets up and into that goal or that weight is going to bring it right back down. So one, one thing that's interesting about, you know, boulder scoring in general, with respect to vision, Lucy, obviously in a lot of matches, your vision was obstructed, right? Like you had, you know, some of these tall defenses in front of you. But some teams had some pretty innovative solutions to be able to align their robots to the tower, right? Um, I think a lot of teams did use some, like, vision tracking and um, sensors to be able to score in those, like Kate was talking about, those little goals. But another big thing was to kind of um, use the human players on the other side of the field as somewhat of a spy, um, where they could give you the green light that you look good to go, everything's positioned, yeah, so in most cases, the defenses were a really big obstruction, especially when you're you're scoring all the way on the other side of the field and there's a lot in the way. Um, drivers definitely did need a little bit of help, um, whether it was technically or maybe like some manual help. Um, I think a lot of teams use their human players on the other side of the field um, to kind of give you a thumbs up or say you're good to go um, and kind of act as a spy, which was another kind of cool incorporation of that theme. So a lot of just a lot of teams were able to use um, some pretty complicated sensors, but also maybe just some vision tracking lights that just gave you an indicator of where your ball was headed. Right. And, you know, speaking of machine vision, we almost take it for granted now um, in modern technology where we have all these COTS products. But back then it was still hard. I'd like to think that 2016 was kind of like the birthplace for um, all these vendors who realize that there's a real market here. Because if you had a robot that, because your vision was so obstructed, that could auto-align itself every time with very little, like, work to tune it, like, that game, specifically Stronghold, like, bred that into existence. Like, they didn't exist then, but it, it was the light bulb for a lot of people of, I should make this easier. I should build a product that is a, a vision systems mentor in a box. Um, and now, like, vision is, like, a big thing in these games still, but the, the floor is a lot easier, or floor is a lot higher because um, the barrier to entry is so much lower where now you can you can buy you know at least part of a solution off the shelf and um, participate in in those types of things which I think is really cool maybe not like necessarily like a direct long-term um, effect the game design committee was hoping for but like a conscious choice of machine vision would be helpful in this game because your vision was so obstructed mm. um, and it it kind of just snowballed from there. Now we've got all these these things available, which I think is great. So, so Kate, um, part part of the end game task we've covered, you know, is the challenge of the tower, right? Um, and teams had the choice of drive up to the tower, be on the ramp, or climbing, right? Uh, once again, we see a climbing task, right? A very unique climbing task in 2016, right? So we had seen, um, you know, specifically 2013, we talked about where there's this rung, right? And you're grabbing on and lifting yourself. Now in 2013, you could go higher and higher. In 2016, it was simply, you know, reaching up significantly higher really than, than we'd done in a while um, and, and grabbing on and then pulling yourself up so that your, you know, visually your, your bumper, right? And your, the bottom of your robot cleared a certain point on the field. And some interesting things about that rung were not only like how, how small it was like width wise, right? So you didn't have a large room for error. It wasn't just like you're reaching out and you'll probably touch it. It was, you only have right this small distance, um, to cover, but on top of that, like having multiple robots try and get up there in such a short time frame and from a ramped angle 
really made the climbs that much more intense. So it was, it was something incredible really to kind of see robots fold themselves up so that they were small enough to get above that line and still count. Yeah, lots, lots of innovation happened from, from that. I mean, driven probably by the fact that there was a low bar in the field, right? And that people were like, all right, packaging challenge. Oh, we got to reach like literally six times higher than my bumpers. That's hard, right? That's really hard. Like we saw all kinds of innovative solutions right down like, like 118 had their like harpoon thingy that they would shoot a hook up to the bar and it actually worked. Like that's the kind of stuff where like on your first week of build season, like that always shows up on the board of harpoon slingshot. And you usually write it off because after you've considered a, that's pretty hard to make work consistently. And yet it worked almost every time for that team. Like they had this packaging problem by the single field element of a 14 inch bar. Um, it's interesting when you're, you know, you're designing your own games to think about all these ripple effects, right, Kate? Absolutely. And, you know, Nick, you, you had mentioned kind of like that harpoon climb. Another one of my favorites is that tape measure climb. So something that you see in the build space daily, but somebody thought, yeah, we can get a tape measure that high in the air. Yeah, we can use that to winch our robot up above the ground. That to me was, was another piece of like, only in FRC do you see this kind of ingenuity of like, we're going to use a daily tool and we're going to make it work to our advantage. Um, but, you know, to your point, right, there was just so many unique things that kind of spiraled out of this game as it continued. We saw teams who were with one mechanism able to, to cross so many more defenses and open those doors. We were able to see robots who, you know, could could overcome vision challenges by adding something as simple as a flashlight to the robot, something that, you know, again, right, it's a simple solution. You might use it daily. Um, and, and here it is on a robot on an FRC field. Yeah, I, I love all of the things that came out of this, this season. It's the last game in our show, but it's the first game of like the Disney era, right? Where the story of the game um, is what drives everything about gameplay, right? You know, right down to the boulders don't bounce so much when they hit the ground to the field looks like an actual medieval, like, I don't know, battleground. Um, uh, like everything about, you know, theme games, I think has been a plus because it. Um, and we're going to cover a lot more of them in our next episode, but this game really like to launch us off of this path of going to the theming route, like really hit it out of the park. Like the mechanics of the game are cool, right? Like the, I'm trying to take down a tower. I'm crossing some things that are hard. Um, I'm trying to hang at the end. Like we, we've seen some of these things like, you know, shooting a ball into a thing and hanging from a thing and driving over stuff. Like we've seen those be, um, objectives for an FRC robot, but when you wrap it into a game and connect them all together, it's so much more engaging for, um, all of the competitors and the audience alike, right? Um, you end up with a game that just, it's super attractive to watch. It's relatively easy to explain, drive over stuff, shoot down the tower. That's it. Right. Um, and you, you just, you just get this really awesome package that really flows together. So, so Kate, um, a couple of you know, our previous games, both 2012 and 2014, they had indicative lights on the field. They had LED lights that would represent something about gameplay, but it really got turned up to a whole new level for Stronghold, right? Absolutely. So, um, you know, I think not only from a drive team perspective, right, and a, and a communication there, but also from an audience perspective, having those indicative lights on the field was a game changer. Um, being able to see instead of having to remember how many times you crossed the defense and if it was taken out was incredible. Being able to know how far you'd taken down the tower another great um like useful tool right so you didn't have to sit there and count like okay i think we put three in and i think somebody scored a low goal but right that vision was difficult for drivers of like did they score that low goal but just knowing with those lights really kind of helped um bring gameplay to a whole new level yeah and it definitely makes it a lot easier for the the audience to follow right lucy i mean like you could you could have them look at the scoreboard which had this information on it but it was so much easier to just look at the field right I think first did it in a way that was really, really well done. And the lights were really aesthetically pleasing and re really simple to follow along with and not only help the audience, but also like Kate was talking about, really help the, the drivers and to know what you've done and what you need to do. Um, it really did simplify everything from both the defensive side, but also to the towers where you were able to see it go up and see how many more you need to do so yeah it was a really effective way of explaining it with that i think that's a great place to end the 2016 game um really want to thank both lucy and kate for taking 
uh, time out of their very busy schedules um, to uh, come chat robots with us and talk about all of our fun experiences um, for Liz and myself, but also for um, Brad Thompson, who is the magic behind the camera, so to speak, and stitching this all together. Um, and also Matt Malinak for uh, kind of wrangling all of the cats together to uh, talk about robots and, you know, put this whole thing on for directing it. So, um, and finally, thanks to the audience as well. Thank you guys all for tuning in um, and look forward to seeing you for episode five. Hey everybody, and welcome to our live Q&A portion of the show here uh, for session four. Really thankful that both Lucy and Kate were available to join us. Um, you know, it's uh, difficult to take time out of schedules to do such things, but we appreciate y'all for sticking around for some live Q&A questions. And we'll, we'll try not to grill you too much, um, but our audience has asked a lot of really good questions. So um, definitely interested to hear what you guys think about them and, and such. Um, so easy one off the top. Um, go with Lucy on this one. I'll ask her first, but this is a question for everybody. Um, what is your favorite game? Could be any game, not just the ones in session four. Um, and why? Um, I don't know if I have a super simple answer to this just because I am not a decisive person. Um, but I definitely have a better frame of reference for like the more recent games. So that's kind of the ones I have opinions on. I would probably say my favorite game as a whole would probably be Stronghold. Um, that game was when I was in eighth grade, so I was just about to go um, onto an FRC team, and it just got me super pumped about playing. It was like the first game that I played on a team when we did off-season events in the fall the next year, so, and it's just, I think it encompasses first really well and is a lot of fun and um, offered a lot of creativity, and yeah. Especially since Cybertooth was a very um, is a very imagery driven team, and so I think that was a lot of fun, and that kind of showed us what what we could do with that too. So yeah, probably Stronghold. I love 2014. My favorite game that I played when I was in high school was probably Power Up, because um, I think it was a pretty exciting game. Um, we had a lot of fun that season. But yeah, long-winded answer, but yeah. That makes a bunch of sense. Yeah, um, I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, like agree with literally everything you said, like <laughs> everything. Um, Kate, do you have a, a differing opinion, same opinion? What do you think? Um, so similar in the fact that I can't decide on one, there's a lot of elements that I like from various games. Um, so when I got started, it was 2003. Um, so Stack Attack, being five years old and watching robots just like <laughs> into those things. Um, <laughs> by far the most exciting thing you can see as, as a kindergartner, um, at least like from a robotics perspective. Um, I would have to say favorite game that I played was probably, probably 2014. Like I just really liked the simplicity of the game, the excitement that you could get from the audience. Um, that was the year I also started learning how to game announce. So it was really fun to like learn the behind the scenes um, side of like the field and communicating with everybody um, and learning how that was going to work. Um, and then I really, I have to say a little bit of 2017, seeing human players on the field was awesome. Um, and I kind of hope to see more of that in the future. That makes a ton of sense. Wow. Kind of trial by fire of having to start GAing when uh, 2014 is going on. <laughs> like, and all of this stuff is happening all at the same time. Uh, I don't know. It's robots. Whatever, right? <laughs> like, I don't Luckily, think there was only one game piece to follow. Um, yeah. In in the next year, in 2015, trying to 
announced like, and they're holding this thing, but then this thing and that thing like that, that was a little more challenging. So yeah. I was grateful to start on like a simpler, easier to explain game. That makes a bunch of sense. Um, okay, moving on. Um, let's talk a little bit about things we haven't seen or the, the future a little bit. Um, Kate, I'll go straight back to you on this one. What game piece or game challenge would you like to see in a future game that we haven't seen yet? Things that we haven't seen. Well, we've seen a lot of shooting. We've seen a lot of pick and place. And I feel like part of that is because it's easy to understand from a from a perspective of, you know, of, of spectators, but also from, you know, like a design perspective. So something unique. Honestly, I would like to see more of, of humans, human players interacting and having more of a role in gameplay, um, more than just inserting something onto the field. Like maybe the robots, it has to go through, you know, two human players before it's it's played or something. I just think that would be an interesting challenge because then you really have to rely on the communication of your team, not just the robot being perfectly autonomous and performing its, fu its functions. So I think that would be a really cool element. I'm not sure what that would look like, but that might be something I'd like to see. Interesting. I, I never thought about like the requirement of having a game piece go through more than just one human player. Like mm -hmm. the human player has been directly responsible for scoring or something like that. That's interesting. I've never thought about that. I, I like that. That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Lucy, what do you think? What what new thing do you want to see? Ooh, that's a good question. I mean, water game. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, um, probably, I think, I don't know. I think there's a lot of, a lot of different things that first can do. I think that we've seen a lot of just like level, I mean, the ground, I think, there's a lot of limitations with just having um, a regular like ground surface carpet, all that stuff. So maybe it would be fun to see um, like different inclines and different like not a consistent height difference on all the um, on the field all the way across. Maybe some uh, like extensive barriers or tunnels or that kind of fun thing. Um, I think would be really cool, especially with um, like defense and having different teams interact in that kind of setting would be kind of interesting mm -hmm. um, and would be a fun thing to explore and maybe change a lot of how yeah. this is played. I've, I've always hoped, kind of in the same vein, I've always hoped that there would be like a subfield that is separate, um, like a higher elevated platform. Obviously there's some yeah. safety issues with that. Um, but like I think of like some some pinball yeah. games <laughs> where say like a pinball machine. Yeah, like a pinball machine where there's yeah. a secondary field either below or above the table, like that would be pretty cool where like maybe you're up there for the whole match or something. I don't know. But Liz, what do you think? Do you have an opinion on this? I don't know. I I think those answers are pretty good. Um I think I said in a previous session, some sort of like like puzzle piece would be really cool. Um maybe not like a you know, traditional puzzle piece, but some sort of Thing you have to get in the right orientation to get points would be really cool. Uh, I don't know what that would be though. <laughs> yeah, huh? I've 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 tried to think about that one since you said it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm like, there's there's a lot of different ways you can take that concept, right? Um, which I like. Um, okay. Um, we're probably only going to go to like eight forty five or so, but we have a bunch of good questions to get through. So mm -hmm. I want to make sure we hit the really good ones. Um, and here's here's a simple one. Short answer is good here. Um, if you could replay any game that has been played so far, which would it be? Um, Lucy, what do you think? Um, again, not super decisive, so I may touch on a few different ones. I think, honestly, this may be controversial. I think Recycle Rush could maybe be a fun one to go back to, just because I think that there was a lot not wrong with that game, but a lot that people didn't like, especially with the whole division of the field. But I think there could be if kind of a redesign, because um, that game was really, really great for showcasing the engineering technicalities that teams could do. I think it was super cool in that respect. So maybe switch it up, make some changes and um, make it maybe a bit more exciting for the audience. I think that would be cool. Also, just from like a personal thing, probably Steamworks too. Um, I think because our team, um, especially in the beginning, didn't have the right approach. At the end of the season, we were really, we were, especially as a fuel robot, we were in our groove. So maybe like replaying that season again, having learned some lessons and um, 
starting out stronger would be would be fun to do. Yeah, I the designer's itch really got scratched a lot in 2015, so I wouldn't be opposed to having to do some crazy stuff yeah. again. I was thinking uh, during off season for Recycle Rush, we you know, tried to knock down the towers with the 2014 balls as well. Um, and that, was, that would be so fun. Was fun. <laughs> yeah, it was. Just for fun. Kate, is there a game or a couple games that you would want to replay? 2005. Um, those game pieces, and, and I loved, you know, I don't know if you touched on this in the session, but I loved how the robots were deactivated when a human player stepped on a sensor so the human player could place the tetrahedron on a robot. Like, I just, I love that, that concept, and I loved the game piece. I loved um, the crazy creative robot designs and how tall they would get. Um, you'd, you'd walk by in the pit and think, there's no way that thing could stack eight high. And then here they would come, right? And, and a lot of teams would save it for elims. And then like all the next thing you know, they could do three more, you know, higher than, than they could in, in quals. So I would definitely say 2005. I would love to see what some of the teams with some of the technology could, could produce now. Yeah, the, the height of the stacks would be kind of mm -hmm. crazy now as modern robot rules and mm -hmm. tech. I, I'd love to see that. I also probably want a hard hat for uh, yeah. <laughs> being field side. <laughs> um, okay, um, we talked a lot about human players and especially in session four, we kind of had the whole spectrum of how much a human player has an, you know, an impact on the match and you know, directly scoring game pieces like you know, Gears in 2017 or simply feeding robots game pieces like um like 2010 was one of them but 2015 as well um and this is this is kind of a controversial question um i'll i'll fire this off to kate first um what do you think the right level of involvement a human player should have um and like impact on gameplay i don't know i don't know if i can like Put that into like a scale of a number um but personally for me i feel like a human player should not be able to make or break a game um the reason for that is you get a wide variety of teams out on the field right you might get somebody who's been a human player for four years and lives and breathes for this and strategy is like what they sleep in um and you might get somebody who's a rookie team who's just like i'm the human player because i'm I'm alive and I'm breathing and I'm here and like we needed somebody. So I offered to do it, but they don't know what's going on. And so I would hate for, for some game to just be broken because, you know, a human player either knows too much or doesn't know enough. Um, but with that being said, as I mentioned, I'd really like to see some more human player involvement um, because I feel like it's a position that, you know, can, can bring a lot of weight to the game and if you're doing it right and you're doing it well and you have a good method then your team has a better chance of, of cycle times or a better chance of um you know whatever it is in that game so I, I would say human players could be doing a little bit more than they currently are but i don't know that i would want it much more than that okay seems pretty reasonable lucy what do you think yeah i think i agree a lot with kate i think um, at the end of the day, it should be a lot more about the robot and um, the drivers of the robot, because that's what the team has put so much effort into um, and really worked on developing as opposed to like one person um, being the human player. And I mean, it's robotics. It's not as much um, of a sport. I think it, the fo that's where the focus should be is be on the robot. Um, I do think that it makes the game exciting and adds a lot of fun. Um, especially, I think I really like the human player roles when it's separate from, like, they're separate from the rest of the drive team, just because I think um, that offers, like, a lot of a lot of places to look, a lot of interactions. So I think that's pretty cool. But, yeah, I think, like Kate said, I don't want it to make or break. That's a lot of pressure for the human player. Um, but I do think it can be a really exciting, especially when the um, the human player has some like strategic role in the outcome of the game. I think that's always kind of fun. Makes a bunch of sense. Liz, do you have an opinion on this subject? I don't know. I kind of, um, I don't know. One of Kate's <laughs> responses to the previous questions got me thinking about, you know, passing game pieces to human players and that kind of thing. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to get the human player involved in a way that, you know, isn't physically scoring a lot of points that like you said it would make or break um a match or something so mm. you know keeping them involved and and i like the idea of even interacting with robots or, or that kind of thing um that'd be pretty cool to see 
Okay. Makes a bunch of sense to me. Lucy, do you have a favorite game piece? Ooh. Um, I'm not sure if I have a favorite. I mean, I think Fuel is near and dear to everyone's heart. That's a that's a, a constant presence of Fuel. Um, I really, I, I'm a sucker for the big, the, the big game pieces. So um, the balls, 2008 and uh, 2014. I think that it just, um, it's really impressive when you see a robot like able to handle something and manipulate something of that size and really exciting. So probably those, um, but yeah, I, I, li I like the big game pieces. Okay, Kate, what do you think? I was muted. I have a different answer for gameplay versus like uh, keepsake. So um, I'm, I'm kind of with Lucy in gameplay. I love those big game pieces, um, like the 2000, the 2008 balls, even the 2004, even though they're a little bit smaller, the tetrahedrons in 2005. Um, I just feel like they're very eye catching. Um, they also have an added challenge of like, how am I going to control this if it's bigger than my frame? Um, so I kind of like that. But when it comes to just like memorabilia, keeping them around, um, the fuel will haunt me for the rest of my life. It everywhere I look, like I see children playing with with balls that resemble fuel, and I just like, oh great, it's there too. Like it's just gonna be wherever I am for the rest of my life, and I'm never gonna see any game piece that's similar to fuel and not just think, oh god, it's fuel again. So. <laughs> Um, I, I feel that in my soul, <laughs> like, <laughs> like every corner of the room I work in, in at Mark, there's fuel in the ceiling, fuel over there, it's everywhere. The CAD model <laughs> of the building. That is true. Yeah, you, you did very yeah. fuel models when we moved in our new building into <laughs> the, the CAD model. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> like in people's offices and stuff, it, mm. it, fuel is eternal. <laughs> um, all right, so a little bit of a, a, a switch here. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the crazy stuff we saw in 2015. Um, I mean, we got to see a lot of, you know, kind of, you know, ridiculous um, robot design things that aren't usual things. Like usually you build one robot, it's got bumpers on it and it's a size, right? Uh, but 2015, the rules, you could build several robots. Um, and a few teams like 148 took advantage of this where they basically had three at one point, but then down to two, um, separate robots all tethered with an umbilical where the like the robot control was on one and like one person drove each. It was kind of nuts, right? Um, is that a thing that like should or could fit in a different games? I know we see that sometimes in FTC, but does that fit elsewhere? And if so, maybe where? Um, Kate, do you have thoughts on this? You know, I don't think I've ever considered it before, to be honest with you. I think, like, for me, the pros and cons of 2015, I kind of talked about in our session, right, where the, the window, they opened all the doors and all the windows, and they were just like, choose a path, which way would you like to go? And it was so hard, um, which was good and bad. And so I think for me, like, as, as a coach of a team, and like trying to rein in the the creativity if someone was like we can build eight different robots and tether them together I'm like whoa wait a minute do you know how to just finish one robot for a competition like let's not build more than than we really absolutely need um so from a team who's kind of competing at that level like I think that I I hope they don't open that door again <laughs> um because I don't know if we're ready for it but for some of those teams you know like 118 who was at that level um and excited to to pursue it i think that it it could be a possibility um but maybe not for all the teams more more of a high lever team challenge seems reasonable lucy do you have thoughts on this yeah um i don't know i think i have i definitely have conflicting thoughts on this i think that the robots that came out of 2015 are like mind-boggling like i remember being at champs that year i think i think liz and i were on carson and I just remember like every single match was, I was just like in awe of how these robots like worked and how they were separate. I think like it was very impressive robots and it allowed for a lot of creativity and a lot of different things we hadn't seen before. I do think like he was talking about, it could be 
it, it is really hard, especially when um, you have such a mindset like we build driving robots that have wheels and are squares. And it's, it's really hard to get beyond that, especially I think for teams that maybe that's what they're really good at or um, they're just starting out. So I think it, it can be, it could be, it would be really hard to bring that up again, just because it's, it's a big challenge, but I, I think it, it offers a lot of possibilities too. And is really fun. So maybe if we see it, tweak it a bit, have a different, um, have different rules around it, but I'd, I'd be open to it. Yeah, I think uh, teams might get very good at building the world's uh, toughest umbilical cables between their sections if uh, this was a yeah. thing again. Because 2015, like, you didn't super have to worry about it because you weren't being defended, but I think we would see some serious tech development happen very fast um, if we true. saw it in a, in a more full contact game. Um, hmm, picking a good question here. Ooh, I've got one. Um, Lucy, do you think we're ever going to get to the point where we see four on four matches where there's four robots on each, each alliance that are playing on the same, the same, same match? Ooh, that's very interesting. Um, I don't know if we ever will. I mean, I think that we've, we've been in three on three for so long. Maybe that would be a fun way that first is like, we're pulling the carpet out from under you again. Like here's, here's another way to go. I do think, um, the game design would probably have to change a lot just because um, sometimes there's only so much you can do in a match or so much room, all that stuff. So I think it would change a lot of things, but um, especially for like big competitions where you have a lot of teams, you have hefty schedules. I think that that would be cool. So I don't know if we'll see it. If we do, probably not super soon, but I think I think that would that would be really fun. Okay, we're gonna see four on four. You know, I think it would be a really nice change of pace. Um, but if they're going to do it, I think they'd have to stick with it and commit because um, it would, in my opinion, it would require a field change. Um, you'd either have to start building significantly smaller robots or or building a significantly larger field. Um, and I feel like once once you commit to designing and building a bigger field, you should stick with it for future years um, from a volunteer perspective, from a manufacturing you know standpoint. Um, so, I mean, I, I would like to see four on four um, potential for more matches still in your in your regular district regional time frame of an event. So that's kind of exciting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I hope so. I think I'd be up, up for it as well, just for the possibility of being able to play more matches, especially at the championship where you're in a hundred team division or something and like you you have hours between matches compared to like district play where you have maybe a few minutes between matches. Um, it would allow that, that pace to change a bit. Liz, do you think that we're going to ever see this? Um, I'm not sure, but I think either that or, you know, maybe some other dynamics like 2v2v2 mm -hmm. or, um, you know, you, you, um, you know, I don't think, I think um, sticking with some sort of alliance is important, but, um, there's definitely other ways to kind of keep the same number of teams in the match, but also change the dynamic of how they interact with each other, which would be interesting. Makes a bunch of sense to me. Um, okay, so this is relevant to, to our session, this question from chat here. Um, both 2014 and 2015 were games that we didn't have a specific end game task that was separate from the main task. Um, like, you know, we had climbing in 2016 and climbing in uh, insert year here. Um, where we just kept playing the game all the way until the end. Um, was that a good thing? Um, and should that come back? Lucy, what do you think? Um, I think it's, yeah, that's a good question. I like end games a lot. I think that it's nice to have like a momentum change kind of in the game. I think that for those games that maybe kind of made sense, it's, more so for 2014, just because um, when you when you're cooperatively working towards a goal and um, you don't necessarily want to break that up, so I think it it kind of depends on the game. But I think end games also offer offer different teams to contribute in different ways, which is something I think I think is really important. And so I do like end games. I think they're exciting, um, especially when they're valued correctly um i mean like 
I think of 2016 when everybody had to rush because that was that was so critical to get on that at the end to get your ranking point. So stuff like that. So I like I said, I think it kind of depends on the game, but overall I'm a big, big fan of end games and just the possibilities that they are and um, as a new challenge for a team. Makes sense. Kate, do you have an opinion on this one? Yeah, I'm kind of with the with Lucy on this one. Like I really like how it'll it'll change the pace of a game. Um, so like you you know you're earning these points, you're earning these points, and then you're like, all right, Scooby Doo sound, last thirty seconds. Like here we go. You know, I need to prioritize um, whether it's going to be you know working on the same stuff they're working on, right? Because in 2017, you could still deliver the gears, right, to try and get things going, or you could keep climbing um, or start the climb. So. I am a fan of having kind of a definitive um, last 30 seconds because I feel like it puts that pressure on, you know, like, all right, let's do this. And the audience has something to re-engage with. Um, but with that being said, like 2014, I felt like we didn't need to, to re-engage because you were still, you were just like, there goes another one. There's another cycler. Can they get another cycle in before, the, you know, like you didn't need that 30 seconds. You were just like, oh gosh, five seconds, four seconds, three seconds. And you're just hoping they can finish a cycle time. So um, it it kind of depends on the, you know, the gameplay, but I think an end game is, is something I like to see. Yeah, I, I generally agree just because of it. It allows you to have another lever to pull for like the story of the match where there's like one last task you're trying to do, you know, preparing your shield generator, whatever for, you know, whatever uh, type stuff or getting back to your hab for the impending sandstorm like that made matches make kind of sense there was a story to it but when there's a sports theme game or sports life game like 2014 i would have been like super pissed to see the game like <laughs> totally change to you and now let's go do backflips um when like you would you would probably lose the opportunity for those last couple cycles like those finals matches on einstein were probably some of the best matches in first history um as we have a visitor over here um like those were some of the best matches because we got to see you know, the star of the show of the, you know, the ball cycles <laughs> make their way all the way through and see, you know, who's actually going to make this last, who's going to, you know, not catch the ball, that, that kind of stuff. Um, so for me, it really depends on what type of game it is, but I, I actually have a soft spot for the games where the star of the show really is that main tally out task. Mm -hmm. One thing that I could see as an alternate is changing the value of game pieces at the end of the match where we see that a lot in auto where there's a bonus for scoring game pieces in auto, but changing the value at the end of the match where, okay, now your goals are worth more to create that last two minutes drama we see in a basketball game or we see in a like traditional football game where you're looking for those last few drives and make them more impactful. Um, that would be something I want to see <laughs> um, personally. Uh, I should have answered this earlier, but I think it made sense here. Um, just sense. to create that drama while the game still makes sense of instead of dropping on your game, Drop on your toys and going home, right? Um, doing something that that you've already kind of gotten used to watching. Yeah, like still having a heightened finale. I like I like that idea. Maybe someday. I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, so it is about eight forty eight. Um, we've kept you here for quite a while, and the last question I want to ask, um, and we'll start with Lucy on this one. Mm, excuse me. Is what are you looking forward to the most coming out of the game design challenge this year? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I would, oh man, it's going to be so fun going back to competitions. I think, I think everybody's just going to be so eager and so excited that this season, this, whenever we get to play again, it's going to be exciting and, and fun no matter what. I would probably say what I look to see, um, I do, I really, I, I mean, keep, I keep on going back to like 2014. And that game is, I do, I really like um, seeing games where there's just like a ton of movement, a lot of stuff going on, um, a lot of exciting stuff happens. I think especially with that game, there was just so many like firsts that kept happening in the season. Um, so a game that, that progresses really nicely and is just exciting at the beginning of the season as it is at the end um, with, with more goals that people are meeting consistently. So I think that that's something that first has gotten really good at, but I think even more of that um, would be would be cool. I don't know. I don't have a really like specific answer for that, but yeah. Kate, do you have an opinion here? Um, 
So we've been working on the game design challenge um, within my team, and I can say probably the coolest part has been the names of the games. Um, just because when you have 20-ish kids all considering, like, what would be the coolest name, a lot of my students notice that alliteration is something that some of the first uh, games have had, so they're trying to, you know, come up with that. Um, but also another thing is just, like, some really unique game pieces um, because they, they also have recognized that there's been a lot of pick and place and there's been a lot of shooting. And so trying to come up with something that is less pick and place and less shooting that would offer more of a challenge, um, and not climbing because they think that we've climbed for just a few too many years and they're ready to do something else, um, in an end game. So I'm, I'm excited to see what ideas come about. I'm also hoping that not only as a result of these like series, but also just teams doing background research on their own that they might bring back some of the elements from old games I would love to see a mini bot challenge again I think it was like so different and so fun um so things like that I'm hoping you know get revived and the first game design committee is going to be like yeah let's throw some of that in why not sounds good to me Liz something you want to see I don't know um I'm interested to see um what teams are going to do with some of the, the themes they come up with too and how um, they work that into the actual game gameplay. Um, I know that's kind of something that first is focused on uh, in the past few games. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if that gets carried on through uh, with some of these ideas that teams are coming up with. I think I, I didn't answer this question in the previous sessions, yeah. but because I haven't been able to come up with a good answer. Mm -hmm. And I think what I want to see is the levers that teams pull that nobody's thought of yet. Yeah. I want to see like, yeah, like, you know, game pieces and like gameplay stuff, but I want to see the stuff that's not the game, like specifically that they pull. Like, for example, like, do they, talking about 4v4, like, do they pull the lever of, you actually have four robots in your alliance, but only three are active at once. Um, crazy stuff like that. Or um, do they totally flip, you know, field design on its head other than you should probably use this border, but like, like, what are the, what are the things we haven't thought of? Um, maybe tournament structure, maybe they get into that in their submissions. Um, like, do you, you know, maybe you play, you know, five, six minute matches and there's a good reason why. Um, like the, the levers that we take for granted, like, yep, three B three, two and a half minute match. Yeah. There's an auto at the start and, um, here's your game. Like, I, I'm curious to see what the, you know, the smart minds in first go. They think critically about what are the, the the givens and see if they change any of them. That's really what I want to see. Um, I also mm. want to see what games don't win. Like I want to see the games okay. that like are the, the, you know, the second closest because those are going to be really, really, really good too. Um, I, I want to see all of them <laughs> really. Um, I, I think that um, I hope that first maybe because that's like a challenge this year um, with the at-home competitions. I, I'm i excited to see what teams come up with for their game designs and how they tackle that. And maybe if they do flip some of those given first things on its head and how um, first could incorporate what teams have to say, because I think a lot of teams have a lot of great ideas and some good feedback. So maybe that could introduce a lot of new fun stuff. Yeah, Nick, that while you were talking, it just popped into my head, robot relay races, like just a back and forth of like, you have to go do something before the next robot can come into play. Like, man, that would be a fun change. Like only one robot could do something at a time or maybe two at a time. And then you play 4v4. I don't know. Mm. That'd be something we're not used to seeing before, but. I'd be down for that. That sounds like a blast to me. <laughs> yeah. I think well, I get to see the mentor matches getting intense for that. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> That's what we live for here, right? Yes, that is definitely what we're here for. <laughs> Anyways, I um, want to thank both Lucy and Kate for taking time out of their busy schedules once again for um, being part of our live Q&A session here. Um, definitely appreciate you guys for uh, both, you know, for the, you know, the main episode, but also sticking around for some of the fun questions here and Kind of getting grilled with the oh, I've never thought about that for kind of questions. Um, also want to thank uh, Brad Thompson behind the scenes for stitching all of this together and making us sound coherent and you know bringing the picture towards you. Um, and finally, thanks to Matt Malinak um, for uh, you know kind of wrangling all of the cats so to speak and kind of being the director to make all of this happen. Uh, but we on on behalf of Liz and I, we'd like to thank all of you for tuning in for 
um, episode four here. And our last episode, episode five, will be airing on Friday, where we'll go through our, our most recent games um, with some live Q&A at the end. I, I kind of expect we're going to go a little bit longer on Q&A that one, because those are you know games that are fresh in people's heads. And I figure there's going to be some opinions to discuss in those games. But mm -hmm. again, thanks, y'all. And we will see you on Friday. Take care.